dive in Hope comes and stops us in our tracks Bravely we prove in our striving Trudging together each day Where there's a will, there's a way Hi, everybody, and welcome to Trudging Together, a raw recovery podcast. My name is Sierra, and I'll be your host today. And today we have Dion Miller as our awesome, wonderful speaker. And we're very (laughs) excited to hear his story. Thank you, Sierra. I I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't get to, um, I have told my story on the podcast before, um, but it was not in a, uh, in a, uh, a, uh, I didn't have anybody else. It was just me. So there wasn't really any conversation, anything like that. It was just something I did. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on my show. I appreciate it. (laughs) So it's kind of, it's kind of nice to be on the, um, other side of this so I can see, uh, what it's like for, um, our podcasters and, and, um, and we're trying, we're trying something a little new today where we're utilizing restream instead of, uh, instead of zoom. And hopefully that will bring a better experience for myself and Sierra. We have some guests here today. We have Evelyn, uh, Sierra's dad has joined us. Uh, Jim is here. They might be peeping in and asking some questions. Um, and we might have some other people join us. So, um, those are some updates and I should probably get out of work mode and into story mode here. Um, so I grew up, um, I grew up in, um, Utah. I was born in Ogden, Utah in 1970. September 18th, 1970, I was born. I was given the name Dion after Dion the Belmonts. And I was born four hours after Jimi Hendrix died. Oh. No, I am not Jimi Hendrix. But I am a drummer, and he was a drummer first, just so people know. But uh, no, I wish I was. So, um, it would be cool, yeah, uh, reincarnation. So, yeah. <laughs> it'd be nice but uh, actually if I let my hair grow out and blow dry it I have Jimi Hendrix hair it gets all poofy because I'm, I'm uh, I have really curly hair so um, <laughs> you know um, we didn't grow up uh, as a real religious family I was uh, uh, raised Mormon um, and it was more my grandparents that really wanted us to go my my grandfather was uh, was the church organist and he uh, he he uh, did a lot of uh, repair for organs, things like that. He was very involved in the church. Um, my family, not so much. Um, so, um, what I'm, I'm going to tell my story a little different today. I've told my story several times, and you know, I've really been thinking about going back into my childhood and thinking about what are the things that kind of made me who I am today. Yeah. <clears throat> And you got, and so the audience knows I'm still fighting a cold, so you may hear me mute. Um, as a child, um, I had a lot. I was one of those not necessarily problem children, but I was a child with a lot of problems. And if that makes sense, um, I was very needy with my mother. Um, I wouldn't let anybody else hold me until I was three years old, and um, and I just always had this. I just always had this deep feeling in my gut about how people felt about me and how they reacted with me. And I've always been able to notice this. It was uh, to find out later of the empathy that I was working with. Um, One of the first things that I can remember was uh, my lazy eye. Uh, It still happens when I get really tired. Pass it on to my grand girl, so sorry. Um, But they got the cleft too, so. (laughs) <laughs> um, Renegade has a little chin like that. <laughs> I, 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 you know, you know what? I thought I was Greek until about five years ago because I never met my father. I didn't know anything about my heritage, but I thought I was Greek because of that cleft in my chin. It turns out, no, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, uh, uh, I'm very uh, British. So, wow. uh, yeah. But you find these things out, yeah. Um, so and what kind of what, Greek? 
My dad has oh. it. He's very Greek. He's 100% nice. Greek. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't have put down baby lamb very well. So, you know, I just, I guess I wasn't. But, you know, it's funny <laughs> how we think we are something, but, but we are not. Because we haven't, you know, I've always been very much into culture. And I'm, I'm sorry, white people just don't have much culture, man. My, we didn't. Um so but anyway the first thing was my lazy eye and i'd have to wear an eye patch and um i remember my parents would argue over which eye it was because they could never remember and i remember i i used to think you know what um and this is when i'm four or five years old what's your problem that you can't remember which one of my eyes is this one and i would always have to i would always have to let them know um, I was also a bedwetter until I was 11 years old. And this was something that was big in my life for a few reasons. Number one, um, I didn't really get along with you guys as it was. Um, I never felt a part of anything growing up. I remember my fifth grade uh, uh, teacher's name, but before that, no. I don't remember anybody's name that I went to school with, any of my teachers because they were just not an influence on me. Um, I was usually bored in school and being born in September, I was also the youngest in my class. So I didn't, you know, I didn't get my driver's license when other people did, I didn't get to play. So it was always these little things that kind of built up on me, right? The other thing with that is I didn't have many people sleep over at my house and I certainly didn't go sleep over at somebody else's house. Uh uh, no. Yeah. Uh, this was the '70s. We didn't have diapers for kids, and stuff. you know, things were a lot different. Um, and I went through several things with that. Before I get into that, I'm going to talk about my speech impediment. At one point, I had a speech impediment, and I couldn't say my s's. So I'd say my brother's not. I'd say it through my nose, and because of the way that I spoke, um, I was. Um, <laughs> Um, I was put into the special class. The The doctor said he's retarded. So I went to a special class. And this was just another way of saying, Dion, you're just not good enough. You're just that not good so enough then. Because you, from what I understand, you were feeling very inadequate and just different your whole life as it was. And now here's this teacher telling you or doctor, whatever, mm -hmm. like that's so terrible. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, and it was the seventies. Not that that's an excuse for, it's not an, it's not a very good excuse. I don't think. Um, no, they should have been did, more empathetic. Yeah. Well, what it did is not only can I say my S's, but I, I decided at that point that nobody was ever going to think of that, of that, of me again. So I went out and I started educating myself and I was beyond, I was beyond the people in my class. I was bored and I wanted nothing. I really didn't want anything to do with these people. I would rather be alone. Um, and I usually was because I just, a lot of times I would talk to somebody and I could just feel how they didn't like me. I could feel like, well, there's something wrong. The thing is, is when people are young and they don't understand something, we are taught to go away from those people. Well, they're not like us, so therefore they belong over there and that's what society was like. Um, during this, when I was about seven years old for my, uh, cause I had been on all sorts of things for my, uh, for my bedwetting and they put me in surgery and I don't tell this story because it's embarrassing um, but I remember going into surgery and what they did is they cut where I pee my urethra open a little bit more and I went into surgery I remember the nurse was cute as hell and I was so embarrassed by this I'll tell you what it did nothing it did nothing for me right um, except traumatize you it was just another thing that had to do with Dion. The thing that really sucked about all this was my name, Dion. My my original last name is actually Dion Bates. <laughs> and um, 
and we're gonna get we're gonna get to that. We're at ten minutes. I'm I, I'm perfect on time here. Um, and that was another step in what was going on. Um, so my name, okay, P on Dion. What'd you be on Dion masturbates? Oh, I heard that man. all my. And you know what? The people that didn't know me. I understood. I'm like, yeah, no big deal. But when it was my brothers and my sisters and my own family doing it, right. it was something entirely different. Um, at one point, what they did is they had this big electric mat thing and they put it underneath me. And well, and if I peed the bed, then an alarm would sound and wake everybody up in the house. Stop. Yeah, so I did that for three nights, and then I went through it in the trash. My parents were pissed. And I'm like, no, that is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I was used to, I was now used to getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning, changing my sheets, going downstairs, doing whatever. You know, I, I had always been a loner. Um, even, even in, I remember going to kindergarten on my bicycle. You know, I could have taken the bus, but. I wanted to do it myself. So, you know, we got to 11 or 12 and a lot of different things had happened uh, since this point. Um, so I have, I have two older brothers and a younger brother and a younger sister. At this time, I would find out later I had a lot more. Um, and when I was uh, 12 years old, uh, my mom and I were going to the liquor store I always went to the liquor store with her because uh, I didn't trust her. And uh, and she proceeded to tell me that my dad wasn't my dad. And I told her, you guys are telling me this about three years too late. I already knew. Mm. That was my other thing is um, my parents just did not consider me to be very smart. And they treated me that way. Um, when in actuality, I'm a fairly intelligent person and I have a ton of empathy and I can feel yeah. things from across the room. You're an amazing person and you help so many people. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so that's when I found out. Now, here's the thing. This man had blonde, curly hair and blue eyes. Look at me. I'm, I'm brown all the way through, guys. I have br dark brown eyes, no cleft on the chin. I have a bold chest. I look nothing like this man, and I had figured it out because I already knew that my old my my older brother had a different father, and that's how I kind of figured it out. Right? But my mom was drinking at the time, and she did something that she really didn't want me to know. Okay. And, you know, what she didn't want me to figure out was that I was an accident because that's what it was. Most Virgos are. Um, and I don't want to say accident, but it wasn't intent, but I certainly wasn't planned. Yeah. So, of course, then we would get into, well, what was my real father like? And, and I could never get a straight answer. All I could ever get out of her was his name. Um, and that she left him because uh, he had uh, he had stolen a bunch of guns and was in jail. Mm. So that's why she left him, which I think is a valid excuse. I think that's a valid reason. And and I certainly do not. Um, I'm certainly not upset with my mom for finding a, a better husband. You know, um, that that's part of life. I am upset because they could have been honest with me from the Thank beginning you. and and developed a much different relationship with me around trust. Because now I didn't trust them. Why why should I trust them? Um, by the time I was thirteen, I was taking care of my brother and my little brother and sister. I was taking care of that. I was uh, paying the bills. That's how I learned how to uh, um, write my mom or forge my mom's signature is by paying her bills. <laughs> now her last name is C and I can't do uh, yeah, S E E. It's not Bates anymore. So I can't do it, but I got out of a lot of school because of that. <laughs> yeah, what is was, was, responsibility though? Goodness. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was an adult child. Neville and saying that now. Yeah, I was, and I was always an adult. That was my thing. And that's why I just, 
couldn't get along with other people. And I'm not doing that. I'm only doing this as an example, not to make people feel worse. My fifth grade party. And this was the last time I ever decided that I was going to have a birthday party for myself. I invited everybody in my class. Jimmy Sinton showed up for half an hour and that was my birthday party. I, and I was just like, I'm done with you people. You want nothing? And I go through this to this day. (laughs) So what does alcohol do? It it stumps us. It stumps us. Um, The other thing and, um, is I was a very, very shy child. And by nature, I'm very shy. Um, I know it doesn't seem that way, but I put myself out there a lot because I have taught myself how to do that since I was very young. Mm -hmm. So I started drinking at at the age of 12. And uh, what I would do is, you know, the way I saw it is I was an adult. So my mom would pass out, right? Drinking, she'd pass out. I'd go upstairs, steal a couple beers after I got done putting the kids to bed. I'd have a chew, have a couple of beers, watch Taxi, and go to bed. Just like an adult would, right? And then my mom decided she wanted to sober up. Man. And this would screw my life. <laughs> A lot of things happened. When I was 14, my mom decided that she was going to sober up. And she's still sober to this day. Um, She has 37 years, 38 years, something like that. Some ridiculous number. Um, Yeah, very proud of her. Her husband, uh, my my, uh, biological father died with over 50 years sober. Um, So I'd have to say it kind of runs in the family. All right? Well, the thing is, is... (laughs) My mom had already figured out that I might have a problem with alcohol, and she forced me to go to AA meetings with her. It destroyed my drinking career, which is good. That's a good thing. Yeah. It also kept me away from a lot of drugs. So I stayed away from meth and everything else because of it, because I knew what would happen to me. Wow, very smart on your part. Um, but what happened to me was I took over my mom's role and my dad decided also that he was going to get help for his anger because he had a very bad anger problem but the thing is is I was taught to drink and be angry to get what I needed done in the house And they were not taking care of the kids the way that they were supposed to be taken care of. (laughs) That was your job. I'm like, you're not. Yeah, that was my job. And she just came and took it. Didn't even think of me, right? You know, why would she, though, if she's not told, right? That was actually a disservice on her sponsor's part. Um, And I would move into that role. And I would play it very, very well. And I was out of control. Not before I was even 15. Um, uh, I ran away to Kansas. That tells you. Yeah. Why didn't I run away yeah, to California? Right. What's wrong with me? <laughs> no, I go to some ho-dunk town called Beloit, Kansas, of which my mom tracked me down at 1984. And, and I was out of control. Um, I was skipping school. Um, I wasn't getting very good grades because I wasn't going to school. I know I did not see any more point in going. I didn't. I'm like I know everything that you've kind of taught me, uh, and that's kind of that's kind of how I felt. Um, I'm gonna stick something in here. Share your your uh, internet kind of. There we go. So just get yeah. Something there it is. Popped okay. Popped up on my screen. Ah, uh, okay. No, not a problem at all. I just wanted to make sure you were okay over there. Um. It was like another restream thing. I don't know what happened, but anyway. Okay. Somebody may have been replying to it. One day, my uh, my parents told me, Dion, you're going to go to the dentist on Thursday. So make sure you're here. Okay. Go to the dentist. Nothing, nothing abnormal. 
Yeah. Um, so I showed up on Thursday and they said, Deanna, um, you need to go pack some clothes. We're taking you to a place called Comitas Crisis Center. And I did not understand what in the hell was going on. Yeah. I didn't get it. I'm like, what? what is going on? You know, dad acted this way. Mom acted this way. You guys didn't go put them away. Well, That's there was right. this little. Yeah. They, they broke your trust again over and over mm-hmm. and over and just treated yeah. you like you were stupid. They didn't. They were not honest. Yeah, they weren't honest with themselves. Yeah. A, a fortunate thing came out of that, though. Um, and that is that they did not do it to my little brother, who had the same problems as me. Or he'd have, he'd go exactly, he'd be going through the same stuff as I am right now. So I thank God that they understood that tough love is crap. Because Phil Donnie, who came out with, I don't know if it was actually Phil Donnie, but tough love came out at this point. And so they tough loved me. In other words, I love you, but I love you from over here. Yeah. So don't be in my world. Um, I grew up in white suburbia, and Comitas Crisis Center is not full of white suburbia kids. Yeah. And so now I had to learn how to survive. Um, from there, I would go to a place called Mount Airy Psychiatric Center. And eventually, my family would stop coming to family counseling because I was winning. (laughs) Yeah, and it was hard for them. Oh, when they left, I would stand by the window and make them feel guilty as fuck. You bet. And they deserved every second of it. I'm sorry. (laughs) My mom tells me, she's like, I used to feel so guilty. I'm like, good, you should have. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, what are they supposed to do? Just let me be at home and be a bad example for the other kids. You know, that's a, you know, so I can't put it all on them. You know, they were also doing what they needed to do. So eventually I got out. Um, But I would spend the next uh, two years in group homes and treatments and, and other things until when I was 16 and a half or now it's actually closer to 17 and I divorced my parents the reason I did that is because I had gone into court I was in court 32 times during that two year period never went on probation, why? because I never did anything illegal except for run away, I was always running away Um, can't keep me (laughs) in fact I have a story on a run away that's so hilarious um and um, and at one point I was actually doing bad. Let's go ahead and cover that. At one point I was doing very very well. I was in a place called Gemini Shelter, and I was third level. I was looking at making some progress, and then uh, the state and my mom decided that it was better to move me. And I'm over here going, no, I'm doing great. I'm on the right path, and I resisted this. So they took me to a place called. Um, Adolescent Family Institute of Colorado, it's on the corner of 32nd Kipling. And I tried to run the first night. And I told them when I got there, I'm like, you guys are not going to be able to hold me. Uh uh-uh. uh. You have too many ways out of this place. <laughs> yeah. So I tried to run that night, got caught, and they put a shirt on me the next day that said property of, of AFIC. All right. And then told me I couldn't go play football because I had tried to run. I'm like, like this would affect me. And then they had me do chores. So what I did all day is I figured out where everything was at. I found my stuff. Right. I found their schedules. <laughs> uh. They shouldn't have left me alone. And I saw in our schedule that we were going to be going white river rafting. I'm like, I want to go do that. But there were notes here that said, parents need to bring them. I'm like, oh, they got to bring me a, 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 a sleeping bag, camping equipment, a tent. This is awesome for you. So you're just set up now. Yeah. To, to so, I, so I go white river rafting, right? And I decide I'm going to be the Boy Scout of this place because I knew how to work it. And I had I had been to hundreds of therapists by this time, been to several treatments. I'm, I can work you. And I just acted like a model citizen while I was there. 
so that yeah. they would trust so that they would trust me see i was so mad at them that i was willing to wait to get get back at them but see that was always my problem is i was always trying to get back at people all right i'm getting to the half hour part so i'm going to start to speed all this up so um fourth of july came around we had already gone uh camping and everything come back fourth of july happens what i did is i decided to have this other guy run with me because i knew if you talk somebody else into going with you you are now a bad influence they won't let you back oh no yeah and so what i did is we threw our stuff out the window through the bathroom and it was a bob wire fence so i got us a blanket and when, when it was chore time i'm like okay let's go book around the building i throw a blanket over and we climb and we're gone and we walk from 32nd and kipling down to southwest plaza nobody's gonna bother us we're carrying camping equipment it's fourth of july nobody's gonna bother us and i was on the run for three months from that place and i was sleeping in my own bedroom for half of it <laughs> i was eating at home i was showering at home they had no idea i was living there wow um and eventually i got caught i'm gonna go back to where i'm in my 30s i was a uh, telephone technician for lucent technologies and uh, i got a phone call for a broken phone at a place called adolescent family institute of colorado so I go down there and I'm like looking at them and they're like looking at me because my last name's Miller at this time and not Bates and uh, and they can't say anything because of HIPAA <laughs> and um, I said I, I looked at her and I said yes I am that Dion and she's like oh my god everybody knows you around here He's, she's like you're a legend <laughs> so it worked they remembered me um, fun little story uh, for some of our adventures. Um, I divorced my parents when I was 17 years old. By the time I was 19, I was living on Skid Row. Oh, goodness. Um, I would go into step 13, a couple of places. But March 16th, 1989, um, something happened that day. Uh, all my friends said, Dion, you cannot sleep on our couches anymore. Enough is enough. We can't do this. And my friend Steve Smedley, I know he wanted to help me out. He's like, hey, Dion, here's five bucks. It'll help you get downtown. And they said, you need to go down to Smerit Shelter and get yourself a bed. So I got downtown about 5.30. This is March. I'm freezing my ass off. And, of course, I didn't know that at this time, but I wouldn't have gotten a bed at that time. I would have been on the street. And I'm walking along, there's this guy in front of me. And uh, he goes walking, he's getting ready to walk into this building, and he sees me behind him, and he's carrying a six-pack from 7-Eleven. And uh, he's like, hey, come on in. And I followed him. I just I had nothing to lose at this point. And I followed him in there, and I saw the AA symbol up on the wall, and I thought to myself, oh, fuck, it got me again. And I was back in. It was a place called the Phoenix Concept. Uh, it is still around today, uh, but I was like the fourth or fifth person to graduate from there. as a year long, and it takes a wow. lot of work. Um, I wanted to go back just a little bit. There was something that I missed when I went to court one day. Um, um, Commissioner Allen <laughs> I'll remember her for the rest of my life Good old Commissioner Allen and Dia Man we had fun times um, She cared about what happened to me She really did um, But her hands were tied too Because of my actions But she told me Dion She said um, Dion you got to go by your last name Which is Miller mm -hmm. And not Bates and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'd like to go ahead and, and change it. Can we put that in? And she said, she said, no, you're going to have to do that at a later date. You're a ward of the state. Mm. I just found this out. I guess I had been a ward of the state for six months. My mm. mom had given up my rights. And this one only hurt because the man that raised me adopted my older brother but not me oh. and my mom will turn around and tell me oh that was because of college no stop blowing smoke up my ass just stop yeah. it. 
Um, that man would have conversations with me, taking me back to adolescent family or wherever, you know, whatever placement, you know, I was on pass. And he would tell me things like, did you know I could have bought three Porsches with the money I've spent on you? And I'm thinking Ew. to myself, I don't even want this. You know, I just want to punch him in the throat. I was yeah. a really, I'm, I'm a pretty small guy. He would, whatever. <laughs> um, these are all things that contributed to how I felt. Um, my parents thought I was gay at one point because I'm kind of a feminine. I would go to and be like, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Turns out I don't, I don't have that much rhythm I, or coordination. I have a lot of rhythm as a drummer, but I have no coordination. But they laughed at me. I'm like, what? Oh, well, you know, and this is the 70s. Well, that's just gay. And, you know, and now, and I never understood that till I got older because I couldn't, I always felt apart. So when I saw other people that felt apart, I felt for them. Yeah. I, cause I knew what that felt like and being in being very empathic, I could feel it. And those were the people I was attracted to, right? Those are the people I wanted to hang out with the odd ducks, man. I'm an odd duck and I love my odd ducks. And that's part of why I do what I do today, because there's a lot of people out there that are scared to tell their stories, that are scared to do certain things because of what might happen. Mm -hmm. um, and for sometimes for valid reasons, you know, um, maybe they don't want to go through that trauma. Um, so I would spend the next year in a place called the Phoenix Concept. And I had a girlfriend at the time. Her name was Shannon. Yes, it's the same person. Oh. Yes, I married her eventually. Um, she'll come back into the story. Um, you know, she was 17 at the time. Um, so this, this is how it works. I, I, we're good. We, anyway. Trust me, the drunk log ain't over. We've got a relapse to talk about. Okay, so I was 19, and I was uh, actually living with my mom, <laughs> paying her rent. And uh, I worked at a place called Skipper's. Um, this was a fast food, seafood place. And uh, and uh, a girl walked in, it was Shannon, and I immediately fell in love with her. Um, so um, I asked her to go out, and she said no for three months. Wow. Yeah. Of course, during this time, I already knew where she lived, had her phone number. <laughs> I stalked her. Now, I didn't get creepy stalky, but I knew where what she lived. I followed her home from work one day. It's only three blocks away, but still. And I would leave, uh, I would leave like comment cards for her. Like, oh, you know, you know, you know, you're 17. You're so sexy when you're doing it, you know, and it's silly stuff. And she still has all of that. All oh. Of it. All of it. Ew. So she was there when I quit drinking the first time and I went into the Phoenix concept and I was homeless. Um, and it wouldn't be the last time I was homeless. So I started on my merry way. I was 19 years old. I'd been in there about two weeks and they came to me and they said, Dion, if we wouldn't known that you were 19, we wouldn't have let you in. But you're here. And nothing happens in God's world by mistake. This program was run by a, a man named Ray Hayworth, who I will love for the rest of my life. Because I'm still learning from this man. Aww. Uh, because Well, with what I do, look at all the sober living stuff that we're working on right now. I, I know how to do that correctly because the Phoenix concept was one of the first sober livings. And they did everything off donation. They didn't even charge for rent because these people needed time yeah. to reintegrate back into society, into life. And a lot of us alcoholics and addicts, um, overeating, gambling, all these things, you need time to reintegrate because you're not going to be the same person. Um, this last time around, I was in sales for 20 years. And I tried to get back into sales when I was sober, and I fell flat on my face. 
Yeah. Actually, no. what would happen is I'd have an anxiety attack and I would run out of the room, literally run out of the room and they'd never see me again. It just wasn't in me anymore. I couldn't do it because I wasn't that person. And I had to accept that. Yeah, anxiety gets real when you get clean and sober. Yeah. And the reason and the reason for that is, is now we're refilling those emotions again, but we're feeling them in a different way and we don't quite understand them yet. Yeah. The other thing is, is we can't even be diagnosed until we're six months clean because anxiety and PTSD look just like and uh, just like addiction. Yeah. So what is that? That's why mental health and addiction get lumped together so much. And it is a separate issue, but we're not going to go into that part. Um, so um, I had a chance to join a, uh, a team at this time. It was called the West Side Drug Free Youth Team run by a man named Patrick V. Hill. Love the man, will for the rest of my life. Now, I have been through a lot of survival skills by this point, and I was the only white person on the team. All right, there was a bunch of younger people. They used to call me their closet uh, vato loco. You know, I made the mistake of asking once when Cinco de Mayo was. <laughs> I didn't live that one down for years. They still give me a hard time. Uh, but I learned a lot. And what we did is we, we had a play that we put on and we were a prevention team. So that means that we're going to tell people about what happens before they start using. Like my mom did to me when I was 14, right? But not with the tough love aspect. And uh, it was fantastic. I was on that team for a few years. Um, and uh, we won the Governor's Award from Roy Romer two years in a row for best prevention team. Yeah. Um, and the first time we won it, we had done a march. We had done a drug-free march, ended up at the Capitol. And um, the, man that, the man that ran the team, Patrick V. Hill, said, uh, hey, Dion, uh, the governor wants somebody to speak after him. Would you be willing to do that? And I said, yes. Now remember, I'm, I know you guys see me today, but I'm a very shy, I'm shy. Ask my wife, I can be very shy. And I got up and there were thousands and thousands of people out there. Now the number one fear is public speaking, then death and the dentist. People would rather die than publicly speak. I got the biggest rush I ever got in my life. And I knew from then on that I just wanted to make an impact on the world. Yeah. I was 19, I was I was still living on Skid Row and able to reach other people. Um, and it was amazing. Uh, from then I graduated from the Phoenix concept. Um, and during that time, I went and got my CAC, which is Certified Alcohol Counselor. And right before I was 20 years old, at the age of 19, I became a Certified Drug and Alcohol Counselor. The youngest one in the state, from what I know. Wow, um, very nice. That, and, I, and, I, and I worked at Arapo House uh, under Joe Wright. Joe Wright started Arapo House, um, and that was also my mom's sponsor, so I kind of got um, oh. Became a cat, went to work at uh, Detox, loved working at Detox. Uh, Colorado, we really need to put recovery back in the detoxes, please. Yes. Um, I'm going to just take a quick minute. This is one of my passions, guys. So there's two ways that the state will give you money for running a detox. Either success rate, which is what Colorado used to be, which means that you get your money depending on how long those people stay sober and in active recovery. It was switched in the 90s when the Bushes came along. I'm all for education, do not get me wrong, but experience is the best education in addiction. Yes. So what they did is they went to the to the detox and they said, hey, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you the same amount of money if you hire people with bachelor's degrees. And our detoxes fell apart because yeah. there were not people in recovery working at the detoxes. Now I think we're down to like two or three and now they're scrambling trying to get recovery coaches back in there but it's too little too late legislation needs to be changed and that is actually something that i am working on 
I actually have a call in to the attorney general for some changes. Very nice. If I yeah. can get involved somehow, let me know or help or something. Absolutely. It's just about doing the right thing for everyone. Um, equal. It's, it's got to be equal, man. You know? So if you go to a detox and you don't hear about AA or celebrate recovery or go on therapy or something like that, you're just going to go on your merry way. Just you're, because I know be something. Right yeah. Because they weren't educated. Now, if I talk with a new person, even if they're not willing to get sober yet, I am going to ruin their drinking career. And I'm probably going to get a text in a few weeks that says, Dion, fuck you and your program. <laughs> and then I will see them in the room the next week. Yeah. That's okay. That's all right. I don't mind. Yeah. You no. Know? Um, if that's what it takes, it's what it takes. Um, at this point, I got married. I got married when I was uh, 21. And um, the doctors had told um, had told her that uh, she was not able to get pregnant. And then she got pregnant. And uh, my, son would, my son would come along. Um, at this point, um, I need. I had to switch careers. It just what you can't work at detox and support a family. Uh, you probably now you might be able to, but back then you could not. Um, and so I started walk, getting to other fields. I worked at Boyer's Coffee. I did a lot of other stuff. Um, I would get divorced. I would get. I would have another child. Um, get divorced again. And I stopped going to AA and working my program at about eight, nine years of sobriety. And I stepped out of the sunlight of the spirit. So dangerous. And by the time I was 12 years sober, I was drinking again. Um, I relapsed on a Coors Light. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> now, if I had been going to AA, I may have gone straight back, but I wasn't. So I didn't have any daily reprieve. I didn't have a first step, first, second, or third step to fall back on. I didn't have a therapist. I didn't have accountability buddies. Are you kidding? Nope. And within three months, I was back on Skid Row. Done. That I decided that it's, <laughs> it didn't take long, and I was right back to where I was, except now I was 32 and not 19. And of course, I came up with excuses. Yeah, well, I was 19. Everybody's alcoholic at 19. Now, nah, well, the difference is, is my friends stopped drinking, well, cut back on their drinking, and they did this weird thing and went to college. Right. <laughs> got, got a degree and, and moved on with life where I did not. I stayed where I was at. Um, and I would go right back to being 19 years old again. Um, I said at this point I wanted to be a rock star so I bought a drum set I know I'm homeless but I we have ways okay when I say I was homeless at this point I'm couch surfing so okay. let's kind of let's kind of I would get to a point where it wouldn't be that but at this point I'm couch surfing okay yeah. and I'm doing other things that I'm sleeping with people that have a roof over my head. I'm doing disgusting and, and things that are just not in Dion's nature. Yeah. Um, so I picked up a drum set, and in nine months, I was headlining at Herman's Hideaway. Wow, okay. Um, turned out I had this knack for drumming, which I've been driving people crazy, tapping everything all my life. Um, and that put me in a much different I got popular real quick, and I was known—I was actually known as Mysticopolis. And um, what I did is I interviewed local bands and put them on the radio, and that was a lot of fun, right? And so what I would do is I would actually go into their studio. If you hadn't put an album out yet, I'm not. No, you're not far enough yet for me to to interview you yet. Yeah. But we do these interviews at nine o'clock in the morning, man, drunk, on coke, all sorts of stuff, man. These guys loved what I do. They, everything was free to me, man. 
I have to pay for nothing. Yeah. Now, remember, I said I avoided drugs. I experimented here and there, loved pot. But I'm, but I'm talking like um, I've never tried meth. I tried acid four times, never worked. I did I did try shrooms, ecstasy. But this was uh, this part. I'm talking about Coke. Yeah. So then I got some friends. They want to get involved with this once a month. Every weekend. After a while, they show up at my house. It's Wednesday. Yeah, every day. I'm I'm couch surfing, but I still know better. And I said, no, we're done. I'm no longer doing that because I know what's going to happen to me. I'm like, you freaking cokeheads. Look, <laughs> right? Drinking my beer. I'm not any different. I, I'm going to speed up um, because honestly... The last the last three four years of my drinking is really where it's at. Um, so ten years ago, I got a I got a, a friend request from Sharon, and she had reached out to me. Now, um, at this point, I had moved out to California to drink myself to death. That was the plan. Um, I didn't get around to it. I ended up working. I never even went to the beach. I was there for a year and a half. Um, but I had lost everything and I was tired of hurting everybody around me so I'm like well then I'll move out to California and I won't be a part of their lives anymore it, it doesn't work it doesn't work you know? I was still <laughs> killing everybody including myself yeah. um, at this point I couldn't go a day without drinking um, but there was always something about Shannon always something and I took her friend request and within two weeks we were back together again oh. I'm not going to bring up that she was married <laughs> here's the thing everybody in the world knew that she was in love with me we didn't do anything yeah, I'm going to let right. you know the steps we took we didn't yes we did some things wrong but we corrected them so yeah. I want people to know that and she would you be a part of it, we are we absolutely are um, when we got together I told her I'm in the heights of my drinking and I'm not stopping um, I didn't make excuses <clears throat> I didn't have to with her because she accepted me for exactly who I was it didn't yeah. matter and she would tell me she told me this for years Dion I'm going to love you till you learn to love yourself and I'm sticking around until I get my Dion back Period. And she would, she drove that into my head. And um, she would work on things like getting my kids back. So now my kids were a part of my life, even though I was still drinking. And they would ask me, Dion, you know, Dad, please quit drinking. Now they're like, oh. Because <laughs> now they're a little bit older and drinking. So, um, yeah. yeah, tables have turned a little bit. Um, and the last two years of my drinking, I would be in detox 22 times. And um, I was shot, man. I was yeah, yellow. You put your body through a lot. Yeah. I was, um, side of my side right here was all swollen. Um, I look like a Simpsons character. Uh, your liver was shutting it was, down yeah if i have one more drink it will kill me uh the last time i drank i had six beers and i detoxed for two weeks wow. never no i don't ever want to feel it and i've never felt that feeling again and i will not yeah. um wow. so there were a few things that happened that made me start to change my mind i got about 10 minutes left i know but a lot of people already know what I do, and I, I'm, I'm really good at shoving things in at 10 minutes. Um, so here's the thing. A head full of AA and a belly full of booze is the worst thing in the world. And by the time I got back, I didn't feel like I deserved it anymore. Feeling There's guilty. No, absolutely. God had told me for years and years and years not to do this and what would happen and I turned my fucking back on him intentionally 
and walked away from him. And I didn't know that he was going to take me back. And that was my fear. And that is a deep rooted fear. And I've qualified that with my story on why I feel that way. I agree. Um, I have that same fear as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, I was given something and I abused the hell out of it. I just abused it. Um, I don't feel that way anymore. No, that, that feeling is gone now. Um, so when Shannon and I got married and we're going to renew, I think we're renewing the vows for our 10 year. Um, I was the only person drunk at my wedding. <laughs> it was at my mom's house. I told you how long my mom has. Um, not, not long after uh, my wedding, um, I had gotten a, a, a letter from my grandma. Um, remember I talked about how I wouldn't let anybody hold me till I was three. My grandma was one of those that could hold me. It was my mom, my aunt Amber, my grandma. I remember that. I remember that stuff. And it's a handwritten letter. And it's not very long. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I probably, I may cry. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. Dion, uh, dear Dion, I'm writing to you because I can express better on paper than I can orally. You're going to think I'm an interfering old lady, but I'm your grandmother and I love and care about what happens to you. So that gives me the right. Love it. Yes, that's exactly how my grandma used to talk to me. <laughs> I'm a lot like her. She is. The thing is, is my, my grandmother was very assertive. She was great at expressing her feelings without making you feel like a jerk. Too yeah. fantastic at it. Dion, will you please, please, please check yourself into a rehab center and get the help you so desperately need to lick this addiction you have? I'm not going to be in this earth much longer, and it is my dying wish. My dying wish is to see you sober and living a happy and fruitful life with your wife and children. Well, that's all I'm going to say, so the rest is up to you. I love you, Grandma. Oh. And I, and I was able. She passed a couple of years ago, and I was able to give that to her. Yeah, she was able to see it. Yes, so she got to be a part of it. She got to be proud of me. Went out there, spent some time with her. Um, she hated funerals. I didn't go to her funeral. She didn't want me to go there. I know it, but she's with me all the time. Um, I have some other reasons that I got sober. Now, here's the thing. You do need to get sober for yourself, guys, eventually. But in the beginning, you take whatever you need to. Take whatever it. reason yeah. you have. Yeah. yeah. It's um, good enough, you know. Absolutely. Well, here's the thing, you guys. I just got done bawling about how the fact that I was afraid that God wasn't going to take me back. It's quite apparent I didn't love myself. By the end, I didn't even want me alive. I would wake up in the morning cursing God for letting me be around another day. Like that, yeah. Because I couldn't do it myself. I was now married. Yeah. I'm sorry, what were you saying, hon? Nothing I just said because you woke up. I said I can feel that. Yeah, yeah. And alcoholics and addicts know what I'm talking about. It's that desperation. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm the kind of person that when I have somebody in my life that loves me for who I am unconditionally, remember, I'm empathic. I'm going to feel that. And eventually, it's going to take over, especially if it's enough. So love does conquer all. Yes, it does. I didn't get sober for me. I got sober because I didn't want my wife and my children to go through this anymore and that got me sober yeah. I do it now I do it for myself because I have to do it for my eventually you need to get there um, but this facade of the fact that you have to do it for yourself from the very beginning just isn't true and that's not my experience um you know, after and it took me a few years to learn how to love myself, because other things would crop in. Um, I would have my first, and so I got sober at forty-five. 
Um, let me explain my dad real quick. Um, as part of my ninth step, I reached out to him. I did find him. Wrote him a letter. He was remarried. It was not. There you go, Evelyn. Thank you very much. That's what I was getting to. And forgive myself. That's what Evelyn brought that up. And, yeah, I was the first person I had to forgive. Um, because I don't feel like I can forgive anybody else if I haven't honestly forgiven myself. Then me doing it for you, just it, it, you're going to feel it. You're going to know. It's like giving somebody a false compliment. They know. Hey, you're looking good today. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, the thought that we need to do it for somebody else, um, I just, I don't necessarily agree with. But, um, you know, for me, life's a lot different. Uh, and, uh, you know, I got about five minutes here to go over what it's like. <laughs> But a lot of you already know what my life is like because you're experiencing it today, too. Um, I now love myself. I can look in the mirror and say, Dion, you're an all right dude. Yeah. It's a great feeling. I do that, too. I say stuff to myself, and even if mm -hmm. I feel weird, I still do that because I need to. Like, you have to love yourself and be your own best friend like you have to hype yourself up mm -hmm. and, and the way i see it is if my wife can love me for who for just who i am why can't i yeah you know you know it would bad things and all you know you know i'm human i have some character defects but i'm aware of them now you know um, where I used to act to life, I now, you know, react to life. Now I act with life. Yeah. Um, I don't make quick decisions. 90% of what I do is keeping my mouth shut. Not everybody needs to know my opinion. Um, so therefore, now when I talk, I do it in places and arenas where it's appropriate. Yeah. And, and I, I had to discover those because, you know, I love to run my mouth now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not shy, that's for sure. Um, is my life perfect? No. I'll get along with my family. Oh, that's what I was saying about my dad. I found out that I had three other sisters and another brother, and they're all older than me. Half of them are in the program. Um, he passed, and he didn't. he didn't want anything to do with me. Uh, he was on his he was on his last days and um, we had a little bit of communication um, but thankfully I had a really good sponsor and I wasn't expecting squat from him yeah. I'm not saying it didn't hurt because it did because it was just another oh pushing D on away right um, Making and I you know feel not good enough. yeah you know, so we're going to get into, I'm going to, I'm going to take these last couple of minutes. I'm actually, I, I want to talk about PTSD and anxiety because we go through this and you may hit a point in your recovery where that's happening to you. See, I re, everything that I talked about, I relive every night in my nightmares people shoving me and my parents are always in it putting me away right these are indications of things that i need to work on so what does that mean that means that i need to go beyond aa to get some help and yes. that's okay heck right. your therapist is on with us today <laughs> yes you know she's played uh, a huge part you know she's a really big inspiration to me yeah well, you know what's so great about therapy? I love therapy. Is I can say anything that is on my mind. It is a it is a release. Now, guys, that does not mean you go to your therapist and they are your battering ram. That is not what that means. You show some respect. All yeah. Right? You you do. Those people are there to help you. All right. Also, a therapist does not solve your problems. You solve your problems, guys. That's how this yeah. works. <laughs> Why? Because it will stick a lot better if I do it. Right? So, yeah. um, so don't, don't 
don't cut off your nose to spite your face. You know, let, let's find out. You, I can't imagine that we put ourselves through all this stuff to not come out with some kind of trauma. Um, show me a man, I'll show you an anger problem. We all got them. Yeah. And we all have room to grow. There That's it is, right, Evelyn. Evelyn. We do deserve the help. We all deserve help, you know? And like healing. Absolutely. You know, um, you know, so that's, that's my, that's the shortened version of my story. And thank you guys for kind of letting me, um, go a different route with it. I know, I know I didn't talk much about what it's like now, uh, but if you want to know what it's like now, go to my Facebook page, listen to my daily reflections. Um, um, I am a testament that this program does work. So thank you, Sierra for coming on and being a part and being a host. Um, it's very integral on what we do here. So thank you. And thanks Yay, for having me thank on. You. Thank you for being on today and letting me be the host. And just, you know, you've given us the opportunity to be able to help people and spread hope and God's Absolutely. love and everything. We can reach people all over the world. And we are. And it's a big mm -hmm. deal. So thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Evelyn and my wonderful dad <laughs> for supporting us. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.